Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the Great Awakening. That's right, one of the hot topics of the day is the Great Awakening. But now, if you are of different beliefs, different religions, different understandings or educational background, you may call this Great Awakening that humanity is about to experience, you may call it by different names. For instance, you may talk about it in terms of the New Covenant. You may call it the Third Temple. You may talk about it as far as New Jerusalem or the Rapture. But there's probably a half a dozen other names that this experience that we're about to go through can go by. So I'm just going to call it the Great Awakening. Because what we're talking about is human beings evolving to a higher level of consciousness. In other words, our conscious is about to be reawoken, the Great Awakening. Now, before you jump off and say that this is some New Age stuff, or that maybe I'm part of some New Age movement, I will say don't be silly, because I am not part of a New Age movement or a New Age religion, or nor have I studied anything related to the New Age at all. I don't know anything about those guys. I do understand that the word new age is frowned upon because people toss that around and say, hey, I don't understand what he's talking about, that it must be new age this and it must be new age that. Well, like I said, don't be silly. Just because we don't understand the thing don't mean that we should put it down. I'm not saying that the new age movement is correct. I repeat, I don't know anything about those guys. But from what I understand, the kingdom of heaven is going to be built up of various people from various groups. For instance, there's going to be New Agers there. There's going to be Muslims there. There's going to be Sikhs there. There's going to be Christians there. There's going to be Catholics there. There's going to be people from the Jehovah's Witness there. Mormons. Just about every religious group on the planet. Just about every spiritualist group on the planet is going to be represented in the kingdom of heaven. That is the way our father in heaven has set it up. He's given each organization or each religious group or each different people just a small part of the truth. And once we go through this great awakening, from what I understand... We're all going to come together. All of these different groups are going to come together recognizing the different elements of the truths that are found in each of their groups, tossing away the falsehood and the lies and the old traditions that are not needed anymore. And they're going to put these truths together and form what's called the kingdom of heaven. But let me tell you who's not going to be there. The fanatical people are actually the ones that are not going to be represented in the kingdom of heaven. These are the people who believe that only their religion is correct. They say, well, I'm of this religion and they believe that only their religion has the truth. And so they reject any of the knowledge, understanding that they can get from the other religions. They're actually the ones that are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. So I say all of that to say that we really need to start learning to approach things with an open mind because everybody, every one of these groups has a bit of truth. That's the way our father set it up. But the reason why I single out the New Age movement is because this great awakening seems to be tied to the New Age, the Age of Aquarius. Now, I don't study horoscopes. For those who like to jump to conclusions, let me tell you straight up. I'm not into zodiac signs and zodiac constellations and all of that stuff either. I'm just a Bible guy. I read the scripture. You know, I don't really get into following any religion or sect or group whatsoever. I am a part of absolutely no organization on this planet except Hermes Academy. And all we believe in is the scripture. And we believe in all scripture. So I'm not an astrologist. But while I was pursuing my Master of Science degree, I did have to study astronomy. 
which is an entirely different discipline studying the stars and in that we learn about star constellations and tying that to my biblical background I understand from the book of Genesis that our father put those star constellations up there for us to be able to tell time and even to understand his story his plan for humanity is actually written in those star constellations now I can't say I can read that story or understand that story very well but I do understand that it is up there and one of the things that you will see up there is the ages that humanity would go through now I'm not an expert on the ages so I'm gonna jump over here on a website called earthsky.org and cherry pick some of the information that they have on their website related to the Aquarian age and the ages that we have gone through see the way I understand it every 2,000 years or so humanity goes through a change back there when the children of Israel were in Egypt I'm going to say the universe went through a change we enter what's called the Aryan age back there in about the time of Moses now before then there was a age of Taurus and an age of Gemini which would have occurred before humans was ever on the planet but when humanity entered this Aryan age there was a great change that took place here on the earth that's what you read about over there in the book of Exodus when you have all of those plagues and stuff that hit Egypt the earth goes through changes when we change from one age to the other but also humans go through a change as well and that's why at the beginning of the Aryan age humanity got the Old Testament of the Bible now this is important to the story every time humanity goes through one of the astrological changes we get a new testament of the Bible new guidelines for us to go by when we entered the Taurian age or back there with Adam the only real guidelines that we had to go by was to be fruitful and multiply but then as humanity changed during Moses' time we had to have those documents rules the covenant and all of that written on stone and on paper and on tablets and that kind of thing giving us rules that humanity was to follow well the same thing happened in the Piscean age whereas we entered Arian sometime back there in about 14 or 1500 AD as you see here the Piscean age started in about 68 BC or right before Christ and that was the purpose of our Messiah coming to the earth is to help prepare mankind for this change that was taking place there in humanity and then once again we got another testament we got the second testament of the Bible which was instructions for us to live by during that period now mind you those instructions didn't take away from the Old Testament at all don't be confused by those who don't want to follow the Old Testament rules and they try to fabricate stories that the father changed his mind when Jesus came and did away with all of those rules and we no longer have to obey the covenant given in Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23 that's heresy that is what Matthew chapter 24 and verse 5 through about verse 10 was talking about when the Messiah told us that people would come in his name saying that they are Christ and would deceive many see the word Christ means messenger so these people are acting like prophets or acting like they have a word from God and what is this word that they're telling us is that the father did away with the Old Testament rules and we don't have to obey those anymore and they are deceiving many see our father doesn't change what he wrote back there in Moses' time is still in effect today he will never change 
Like the Messiah also said, not one jot or one tittle of the law will ever change until the planet itself is done away with. See, it is the universe that is changing. It is humanity that is changing through these ages. But our father, who is bigger than the universe, who is older than the universe, never changes. And his word never changes either. But I digress. So we were born in the age of Taurus. That's about the time that Adam was created. And then about Moses' time, humanity changed or the universe changed into the age of Aries. And we got the Old Testament of the Bible. And then in the Piscean age, right before the Messiah came, we entered the Piscean age. And we got the New Testament of the Bible. The thing about it, humanity is about to change again and we're about to go into what's called the Aquarian Age. But if this pattern holds true, the Aquarian Age has already started. We're just waiting for the signs to take place on the surface of the planet and in humanity itself. Now, we do several classes on our channel related to the tribulation or the apocalypse that will be the signs that will take place on the planet signaling the Aquarian age. But in this class, we want to talk about the changes in humanity, the great awakening, which will be a shift in our consciousness. Now, we are a Bible based channel over here at Coach in the Fight part of Hermes Academy so in order to bring this out we're going to show you how the Great Awakening is described in great detail in the scripture we have been told about this Great Awakening for thousands of years in the Old Testament and in the New Testament or the Second Testament so let's jump over to one of the first places that you start to hear about the Great Awakening, which is over in Daniel chapter 12. See how he starts off and says, at that time, he's talking about now. He's talking about this period that we live in now. This event that he's talking about could take place in any day now or even any hour now. But what he's talking about is how Michael will stand up. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Michael is an archangel known as the lawgiver. Of course, our creator is the supreme being, but he has many spiritual entities that he has created to help him with his tasks, including several archangels with several different jobs. There are, in fact, seven archangels, like, for instance, Raphael, who is in charge of our health and well-being, Gabriel, who is in charge of our consciousness, Uriel, who is in charge of our repentance, Michael, as we said, is in charge of the law, and then there's about three or four more that I can't name off the top of my head who have different responsibilities to help humans, to help humanity. That is their job. Right here is talking about Michael and how when he stands up, there's going to be a time of great trouble. This is the tribulation. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm still waiting for confirmation from the Father on whether or not this great awakening starts the tribulation or whether the tribulation starts the great awakening we're going to touch on this a little bit further in this video so let's wait and come back to that he says this trouble will be greater than any trouble that has ever taken place on the planet before in other words what they experienced over there in egypt with the ten plagues is going to be nothing compared to the great tribulation Noah's flood ain't got nothing on what we are about to go through here. And then he goes on to say how those written in the book of life will be delivered or will be spared from this great tribulation. 
but we're going to get into that a little bit farther along in the video as well I bring you over here to Daniel chapter 12 to focus on a few verses and one of which is verse 2 where he says and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake and then down there in verse 3 and he says and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament this is the great awakening that's going to take place in humanity or at least part of it you're having a change in those who are alive and in those that are asleep and this of course could mean spiritually asleep but it also means physically asleep let me show you this in some other places you see over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 how he says we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed this change that he's talking about is the great awakening he says in the twinkling of an eye the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed this is the same thing that's talked about over there in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 see this change is not only going to affect humans walking around in the flesh but it is also going to affect those in the spirit world the entire universe is going through this change the universe is about to be changed first Thessalonians and chapter 4 verse 14 is again talking about the same thing that's what's meant down there in verse 15 when it says that those which are alive will not prevent those which were asleep Paul was trying to tell them about this change that humanity was going to go through and in this chapter the people were worried about their dead relatives and saying well what about the people that have passed on are they going to miss out on this great awakening and Paul is telling them no they're going to change too In verse 16 he said the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel which is Michael that we talked about over there in the book of Daniel see how all of this ties together now there's a lot of people getting wrapped around the axle when it comes to this verse right here especially those who adhere to the doctrine of John Nelson Darby and Morgan Edwards the founding fathers of what's known as the left behind church I call it that because the story that was created by Edwards and reiterated by Darby was promoted heavily in a series of books called the left behind series and even though this story was fabricated back in the 1800s because of the popularity of the left behind movie it has now formed into a religion where people believe that they're going to somehow be supernaturally removed from the planet before the tribulation ever starts well let me run off on a tiny tangent and show you a few fun facts that dispute that doctrine you see right here how he says the Lord himself will descend from heaven it doesn't say that human beings are going anywhere it says that our father the Lord himself is going to come down here where we're at we're not going up there he is coming down here that's what's talked about over in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2 when he says New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven everything is descending down to us we are going nowhere 
like Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 30 says, the righteous shall never be removed. And then it goes on to talk about how the wicked shall not inherit the earth. See, these are the prizes that's up for stake. The inheritance of the earth. Those that get removed off the planet won't have the opportunity to take advantage of this inheritance. But those of us who survive the tribulation will get the earth as our spoil. This will be our planet. No longer ruled by wickedness. But look over here in the book of Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. It's telling us to get this inheritance we have to go through much tribulation. We have to go through the tribulation. Not escape from it and fly off somewhere. You have to suffer and survive the tribulation in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So coming back over here to 1 Thessalonians. And it's talking about the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is not talking about some flyaway rapture moment. This is talking about the great awakening and how those who are dead in Christ, those of the righteous that are presently in the spirit world will go through this awakening first. And then us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So when you read this closely, Paying close attention to what's being said here and rejecting the doctrine of those people who come in his name claiming to be messengers. What you see here is that our Lord comes down to us to where we're at and then the dead rise and then we all meet together. But where are we meeting? In the clouds. And is he talking about materialistic clouds made of H2O? About 35 or 55,000 miles high in the sky? No. He's talking about the consciousness cloud. He's talking about the great awakening. The same thing that's being talked about over here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And three. Now, Daniel goes on to let us know that everybody is not going to get this. Even after the event occurs. You see down there in verse 10. He's talking about the tribulation. He's talking about the great awakening that will occur right before the tribulation. He's talking about the great awakening that may be the cause of the tribulation. And how many will be purified and made white and tried during the tribulation. Which confirms what Luke said over there in the book of Acts. About how in order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven we have to go through tribulation. He says much tribulation. Over here in Daniel he's saying that those who do wickedly will not understand this. But only the wise will understand. And by wicked, he means the transgressors of the law. Those that don't obey the covenant given by Moses over there in Exodus chapter 20 through 23. These individuals that are in rejection of the scripture, they will awaken to shame and everlasting contempt. While the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. But those that really want to be made bright during this time will be those who turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's confirmed over there when the Messiah says that those who teach that we are not supposed to follow the law will be counted least in the kingdom of heaven. While those who teach obedience to the law will be counted great in the kingdom of heaven. Daniel says that they will shine as the stars forever and ever. 
The ears of those tuning in from the Mormon church should have perked up as these could be instructions to support some of their doctrine. But I digress. Well, let me show you something else before we change gears. And that's coming out of the Third Testament of the Bible. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, when humanity made the change from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries, we got the Old Testament of the Bible. When we made the change from Aries to Pisces, we got the New Testament of the Bible or the Second Testament of the Bible. And I call it the Second Testament because as we're making the transition from the age of Aries to the Aquarian age, we have gotten the Third Testament of the Bible. Now you can find a link to this book in the description of this video. Both an audio book and a PDF that you could download to your computer. These are the instructions that our Father has given us in order to go into this new age that humanity is about to transition into. Now this document is highly suppressed as you can imagine especially when you think of how many of the biblical teachers are trying to suppress the doctrine given by Moses and many of the other apocryphal books that teach obedience to the laws given to Moses they're trying to suppress this doctrine this document as well because it also teaches obedience to the laws given by Moses in other words those people who want to tell you not to obey the covenant definitely don't want you to see this book because not only does it bring it home and help us to understand the finer elements of the law, but it tells us what we can do with that law and how we can use those powers and how we can use that law in order to take advantage of the power that the Father has given us. But those were really not supposed to be miracles. They were really only supposed to be examples of the power that we all have. We all can cast out demons or control the elements or heal the sick. But when you look, there's not a lot of people who are actually doing those so-called miracles today. Well, when we get our hands on this book, the Third Testament of the Bible, understanding its teachings and doing like it says, going back and rereading the Old Testament and the New Testament in order to get the doctrine that was taught by Moses and the Messiah out of those, we will be able to perform those miracles just like the Messiah did. We will be able to follow his example. Well, in this class, I really only want to bring out a couple of verses from this book. And that's how it is expounding on what Daniel was talking about over there, about how some will awaken to everlasting life while others will awaken to shame. You see that right here in chapter 4 and verse 27 when he says, when our father says that he shall limit himself according to the evolution of each spirit. He's talking about how we have to ascend Jacob's ladder in order to take advantage of this great awakening. We're going to be awoken anyway. But if we don't have this spiritual evolution... We're going to be awoken to shame and remorse. Now let's jump over here to chapter 57 and verse 11 of the third testament of the Bible. Now let me read what it says here. It says, I have told you that the moment will come when the light shall shine from everywhere. 
in all the lands and all continents. That's what first Corinthians and chapter 15 is talking about when it says we all shall be changed. I hope you're realizing how this is being repeated all throughout scripture. The Old Testament, the New Testament and the Third Testament is all talking about this great awakening. It says that light will shine according to the spiritual preparation of man. We have to be prepared. And through it, a new and more accurate idea of creation will be formed. A new stage of spiritual evolution. The Great Awakening. This is what humanity has been building up to for a long time. But those that are going to fare better off in this moment will be those that are spiritually prepared. And how do we get prepared? You should know the answer already. I keep repeating this over and over because I want to be one of those who shine like the stars forever and ever. But let me come over here to Malachi and chapter 4 and show you what it says about the Great Awakening. But before I do, since it will be a transition point to the next part of this lesson, and that's when this awakening will take place. Let me show you in Malachi chapter 3 how there's a connection made between Michael and Elijah. Now, if you haven't heard of Elijah, I would advise you to go over to our channel and check out a couple of videos we've done on Elijah and the Elijah spirit. You remember that he was one of the figures standing there during the transfiguration on Mount Tabor with the Messiah there. When he came down and presented himself before the disciples, it was Moses, Elijah and the Messiah standing there. That should tell you how important this Elijah figure is. In a way, you could think of it as Moses brought you the Old Testament. The Messiah brought you the Second Testament or the New Testament. Elijah is the one that's bringing us the Third Testament of the Bible. But looking here in chapter 3, it appears as though Elijah, who is described as the covenant angel, the messenger of the covenant is the same as Michael. After reading chapter 3 of the book of Malachi, I believe that Michael and Elijah are the same entities. It's like we call him Michael in the spirit world, but then when he came in the flesh, we called him Elijah. But I believe they are the same people. If you would, jump down in the comment section and give me your opinion on what you think. I'm not absolutely sure, but I think I find it quite interesting that they're so similar in what they do and what they have done. But coming over here in the fourth chapter of the book of Malachi, which is the last chapter of the Old Testament, I want to read verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord well isn't that what we seen over there in Daniel chapter 12 when he says Michael shall stand up and there shall be a great time of trouble we have Michael standing up before this great time of trouble in Daniel chapter 12 and in Malachi chapter 4 we have Elijah the prophet coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord I believe these are the same individuals. But like I said, leave your comment below. What I really wanted to show you guys is over here in verse 4. Because these are instructions that we have to adhere to if we want to take advantage of this Elijah spirit that's supposed to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It says that we have to remember the law of Moses my servant with the statutes and the judgments 
I bring this out because there's a lot of confusion in the church as to what is the law. There's many people that want to say that we aren't supposed to be adhering to the law. And a lot of times I'll ask them, well, do you even know what the law is? See, this game is like chess. It ain't checkers. And so we have to make three or four moves ahead. So the reason why I ask them that question, do they know what the law is, is because my next question is going to be, okay, so what in that law should we not be following? Well, if you look here at verse 4, it's telling them exactly what the law is that it's being referred to, or it's telling them what exactly is the law of Moses when it says, which I commanded unto him and Mount Horeb for all of Israel. And you say, well, what did Moses get at Mount Horeb? He got the book of the covenant. You see, the end of the book of the covenant over here in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people, which said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. That was given at Mount Horeb. So the law isn't all of the Torah or all of the Old Testament. The law starts in chapter 20 with, as you probably would have guessed, the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. And in chapter 21, you see the judgments. And then in chapter 23, you see the statutes. So this is what Malachi is talking about when he says, remember the law of Moses, which I commanded unto him in Mount Horeb with the statutes and the judgments is talking about the book of the covenant It's talking about those four chapters over there from Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23, which absolutely ends at Exodus chapter 24 and verse seven. But here, right after he talks about the three mandatory feasts that constitute the statutes, he talks about an angel that shall go before thee, that shall bring thee into the promised land. This angel that he is talking about is the same angel we see in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, where we call Michael, and it is the same angel we see in Malachi chapter 3. The messenger of the covenant. And who is this angel? Well, we see him in Malachi and chapter 4. It is Elijah. The same figure that we see that makes up one of the two messengers over there in the book of Revelation. You should check out the book called The Apocalypse of Elijah and you will see that this is a spirit that will descend upon mankind. In other words, the descension of the Elijah spirit is what we read about over there in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 when it says the Lord himself shall descend with a shout. But anyway, I fully expect the comment section to get interested when it comes to that point. But let's go on. It says that he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Talking about the great tribulation. It is important to note that it is because of this Elijah spirit that many will be spared from the curse of the tribulation. There are those who are wondering how are we going to be saved from the tribulation? How are those that are going to survive the tribulation? Now, like we talked about earlier, there is one camp of people that believe that they are going to be physically removed from the planet before the tribulation ever starts. But if you're understanding anything out of this class, you understand that it is actually going to be a great awakening that is going to take place in the hearts of humanity with those who are the most spiritually evolved or the most prepared or 
speaking plainly, the ones who have obeyed the laws given in a covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 23, that will have the indwelling of the Elijah spirit that will guide them to safety during the tribulation. But notice this point right here where he says, Elijah the prophet before the coming and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, this points to the timing of this great awakening. It's saying before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Let's jump over to the book of Revelation and show you when this is actually going to take place. You see over here in the book of Revelation and chapter 15. It's talking about the seven angels that has the seven last plagues. It is these seven plagues that's going to constitute the majority of the tribulation that this earth and humanity will face. You see right here in verse 2 where it's talking about those that have gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. And over the number of his name stand on a sea of glass having the harps of God. This is talking about the 144,000 and that multitude that no man can number. These are the ones that sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. That song that he's talking about, I say again, is Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23. The song is talking about is the law given to Moses. But look down here in verse 5. Where he says that the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. This is another way of saying the great awakening. This is what the great awakening is all about. The third temple which will be built on the hearts of humanity will be opened. And when will it be opened? Before the seven vials are poured out on the earth. So this is why I said earlier. Does the great awakening start the tribulation or does the tribulation start the great awakening? It appears from what we're looking at here that the great awakening happens first. You can see further evidence over in Revelation chapter 8. 11 verses 18 and 19 where it says how his temple of the ark of his testament the temple of God was opened in heaven and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail it is these voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake and hail that will signal the great awakening this third temple being opened well when you jump over here to Revelation and chapter 7 you see that it is this great hail that comes at the first trumpet blast before any of the angels have sounded do we have this great hail And when you look back at verse 5, you see the thunderings and the lightnings and the earthquake and the voices all taking place before the trumpets ever blow. The temple is opened. The great awakening takes place before the trumpet blast and before the vials. In other words, the great awakening occurs before the tribulation or at the start of the tribulation. So does the Great Awakening start the tribulation? Put your answer in the comment section below. There's one last thing that I want to show you guys before I wrap this class up. Now I hope you guys appreciate this level of information that you're getting. If you do, go ahead and hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button and that bell notification button so you can get these classes when they come out. Share it with your friends. They may not know it now, but they will appreciate you for the heads up when this day comes. This great awakening is going to affect them too. 
And if they have this seed of information in them, they may not be tricked by the great deception that's going to take place alongside this great awakening. Yeah, the world systems, the, the B systems are going to tell a deceptive lie that's going to tell people something different than what's actually have taken place. And if you have shared this video with some of your loved ones and some of your friends, they may have it in the back of their mind and they could be ready when it actually happens and not fall for the great deception. Now, this last thing that I want to show you guys now it's important. It's also addressed over here in Revelation and chapter eight. It's talking about and the angel came and stood at the altar having the golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. Now, this all reminds me of what takes place during the Feast of Atonement. This seems like an Atonement Day festival here or an Atonement Day event here. When it's talking about the golden altar which stands before the throne and the incense. This is what Aaron did once a year. And so is there a connection between Aaron and the angel of the covenant? I believe all of this is connected. Notice how all of these events. This atonement day scenario is taking place before the temple is opened. Before the tribulation starts. So could atonement day be the day that the temple will be opened? Now, I don't know for sure. Of course, nobody can be for sure until after it is already taken place. But knowing that we are waiting for a prophetic fulfillment of the day of atonement. And it has something to do with the altar. That is when all of humanity is supposed to go before the altar. If you know anything about the great holocaust that is tied to the great day of atonement. That great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's talked about I believe over there in Malachi chapter 4. I believe we should be paying attention. But let me show you this right here. Now this is coming out of chapter 2 of the book called 2nd Esdras. In verse 38, it's talking about how we are sealed during the feast of the Lord. Now, I could go on to show you how the sealing of the 144,000 is part of the Great Awakening. But this video is already starting to get a little bit too long. But notice here how the sealing takes place at the feast of the Lord. At the Lord's feast. Which I believe is also making a connection. With atonement day. Or the memorial of blowing the trumpets or tabernacles. So I say all of that to say. In order to get prepared for this great awakening. We need to be making sure. That we do what the scripture says. Which is remembering the law of Moses or the covenant. I say again Exodus chapter 20 through 23. With the commandments and the judgments and the statutes. And what are the statutes? The feasts of the Lord that you read over there in Leviticus chapter 23. We have to remember the feasts of the Lord. Now the only other thing that I have in my notes that I didn't talk about yet was the three and a half years. That the Gentiles will be trodden the temple underfoot. Now what does that all mean when it comes to the great awakening? Well, like we've talked about several times. It is those that are prepared that will shine or farewell during this great awakening. While the rest will be in remorse and shame. Well, from what we understand, they will be under this great deception for three and a half years. Before they realize that the great awakening has actually taken place. 
But we'll save all of that for another class. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button or that bell notification button if you haven't done so already. Hit the like button and remember to leave a comment below. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Godspeed and Shalom.